friends pray with me. God, we're thankful for this time that um, we can come together, whether it's in person or with our families at home. And we're thankful that we have the technology that no matter what's going on in the world, we can still worship you and learn about you through your word. And we're thankful for the truth of that song that no matter what we're going through, no matter what happens, we have a weapon, and it's just to call on your name, to praise you, and heaven will come and fight for us. And in this moment today, I just pray that we continue to worship you with our whole hearts abandoned, and that when Pastor Randy brings the message, that we'll be open to receive that and to grow from it. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning, Crossroads family. Great to be with you this morning. It's Pastor Randy, and uh, we have just concluded this uh, wonderful series on Colossians uh, about Christ alone, and we embark today on a new journey uh, into the book of John. It'll be a relatively short journey because we have some exciting new things uh, happening in November, as you probably are aware of, uh, with uh, Brian Raynard coming to uh, uh, to take on the lead role here, and so I'm just excited for what God's going to be using him in this role to do, and um, in the meantime, uh, John seemed like the, the perfect landing spot uh, to conclude um, my time as uh, in this role uh, as senior pastor. So we are launching into John, and the goal of this series is this, to realize that Jesus' life demonstrates that he is divine. His life demonstrates his divinity. Jesus is one with the Father. So we're going to look at scripture and and see how that plays out over the course of the next few weeks as we dive into this study uh, on the life of John. So here's a little context for the Gospel of John, and I need to back up just a touch before I get there. So hang with me for just a second. Several years ago, uh, Andy Stanley, who is a pastor and an author and uh, son of Charles Stanley, who most people know, quite famously and publicly stopped saying the words, the Bible says. Not because the Bible didn't say it, but because those who already believe in the Bible should know what the Bible says already. And those who don't believe in the Bible won't believe you just because you say, the Bible says. So instead of saying the Bible says, he began uh, referencing the author by name, referring to the writing not as a, as a book, but what it actually was, a letter to a person or a letter to a group, uh, a historical document, uh, a travel log, a recounting of a firsthand account, etc. Placing the author in his historical context and demonstrating the author's credibility for the writing and relaying to his congregation that each author of the Bible wasn't writing the Bible. The Bible came later as a collection of these letters, accounts, and documents. And with that, I want to introduce to you this person, this historical figure, this man, friend of Jesus, who wrote his account of what he saw Jesus do, titled by his own name, John. John was a follower of Jesus. He was a Galilean fisherman. He was brother of James and son of Zebedee. James and John, uh, brothers, their dad was Zebedee, a fisherman, owned a, a fishing business, it appears, and his sons were uh, part of that uh, enterprise. Jesus refers to the brothers as sons of thunder, and uh, that's just awesome. I don't know. I just love that. Um, some, some people reference uh, that as because of their fiery enthusiasm or their exuberance. And uh, I just wonder if anybody um, thinks of you that way, uh, your exuberance for the Lord, uh, that you're a son or a daughter of thunder. John, is, um, is John and his brother James, along with Peter, were considered among Jesus' inner circle. John is also credited with writing uh, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and then finally, the last to what we call the book of the Bible, Revelation. The book of James was written. Um, the book of James was written by Jesus's brother, not this James, brother of John. John, along with all the other apostles, uh, was executed for not recanting his belief that Jesus rose from the dead. Now I know I just said that he was executed. Now I'm going to tell you that he was not. History reports that John survived the execution attempt on his life. The Roman soldiers considered it a miracle and shipped him off to the Greek prison island, Patmos, which is still there today, where he lived out his life and where he received a revelation or a vision from Jesus that he titled Revelation. So the purpose of this letter is actually uh, contained within the, the letter itself. It's, it comes from what we now refer to as John 20, 31, and again, the reason I'm pointing that out is because when John wrote this, he wasn't 
creating chapters and verses and subdividing it and cross-referencing it. He was just writing uh, his account of what he experienced in, in uh, following Jesus around for three years. So the purpose of the letter is this, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That is so beautiful. That is so wonderful. That is so incredible. That he's telling us, whoever would be the listener or the reader of this letter, that he's writing it that you may believe, you, dear reader, that you may believe and have life in his name. A little background, um, his account of Jesus' life departs pretty dramatically from the other three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those all start with, um, with the birth narrative. Mary and Joseph and a donkey and a star and a manger and a baby. John's account starts in a different place. And while some people would say it starts much later in the story, I'm going to make a case right now that it actually might start even before then. He starts in the beginning. You mean the beginning of Jesus' life? Sort of. So let me try to set the stage here. Genesis 1.1. So that is as beginning as you can get in terms of the written text. Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John 1-1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So the capital W word, the Greek uh, for that is logos. People pronounce that in different ways. I'm just sticking with logos. Uh, But the point of, of this is that Jesus, the word, was in the beginning. Well, which beginning are you talking about, John? In the beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. Jesus was there then. If you have never been taught that or learned that, it is a mind exploder, I know. And it still boggles my mind all these years later, trying to grasp this this idea, this concept that Jesus, the man God, was present with God, the Father, at the beginning of time, before time began. Genesis 2, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Take that in just for a second. The earth was was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. John 1, 2, he was in the beginning with God. So we're going back to that, and now you're going to see what happens next. Uh, Verse 3 of chapter 1 of Genesis, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Verse 3 of John, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So we're getting this whole idea that Jesus is the creator. Now check this out. Verse 4 of Genesis 1. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. Ready? Verse 4 and 5. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. Are you seeing the parallels here? Verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So John is referring to Jesus as the light. The same light that was created and separated from the darkness at the beginning. This light becomes personified in the person of Jesus Christ. Incredible. We could stop there, tell everybody to go home, turn off your TVs and devices. That's enough to take in for a while. But I want to dive into a few verses and show and try to demonstrate that that light of Jesus represents love. I want to talk about today God's love. 
The key verse today comes from a very, very familiar passage, John uh, chapter 3, verses 16, 17, 19, and 21. Forgive me for skipping 18. You can check that out yourself. Uh, I just want to stick to these verses and pull from this text what I think God is speaking uh, to me about and to us about for today. So the key point is this. Jesus is the very image of God and proves his divinity by saving us. So how does he save us and why does he save us? We want to look at that today. Would you just pause for a moment uh, and join me in prayer? Lord Jesus, we cannot grasp your enormity. We can hardly take in and comprehend how vast, how expansive, how huge you are. Lord, so often, and forgive me when I do this, I, I, uh, I, I bind you to earth. I start your existence at the manger. And I think of your life as ending at the cross, and we know, of course, you were raised from the dead. But Lord, we, we kind of put you into this time constraint. So Jesus, help us to wrap our minds around this idea that you are eternal. You are from the very beginning and to the very end and all points in between. And that your light is love. And that you loved us enough to save us and by saving us, proving that you are divine. You are one with the Father. We thank you in Jesus' name. So what does it say? Verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That whoever, probably could stop there for a second. You might be asking yourself, what about about me? Do you know about my life? What if he knew what I did? Can I fit into that whoever category? Well, I will tell you, and I believe this to be absolutely true, that God had you in mind when he said whoever. It was without exclusion. Anybody. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that absolutely anybody who believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So check this out for a second. So... From the, from the writing of Genesis all the way back and the writings, the other writings of Moses. Moses lived circa 1450 BC. That's a long time ago. Over 30, 3,500 years ago. So from that writing to John's writing in 80 AD, that was about a 1530 year span, and then from the, um, from the beginning of Christianity, another almost 2,000 years, so this total of 3,500 years, one thing remained the same. From the writings of Moses all the way through to the teachings of Jesus, all the way through to the teachings of the church, all the way through to me speaking these words to you today, one thing has remained true. That God so loved the world that he gave his only son, he made a way that anyone who believes shall not perish, but have eternal life. It all hinges on belief. And we're bound today to have to dive into that a little bit further. Verse 17, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. We have to wrap our heads around this, and I'm going to dive into it just a bit. But in order that the world might be saved through him, Jesus didn't come to condemn. He came to save. So I express to you through the RHV, 
the Randy Hinshaw version is this. Listen, God doesn't hate me. Can, can you believe that? I mean, I don't like living with me most days. I'm hard to live with. I know I, I'm with me all the time. That the God of the universe, who is holy and righteous and pure and all of those things and, and so amazing and the creator of all things, that when he looks upon me, he sees someone worthy of love. And I, most days I can't grasp that. And when I can grasp it, it's hard to believe. When I compare who I am and how I think and what I do and how I run sometimes from God, that he doesn't hate me. He doesn't even dislike me. He's not looking for loopholes to give me the punishment that I deserve. Jesus didn't go through hell on earth to now condemn me. The cross wasn't there for Jesus to go through so that he could later find an excuse to condemn me. But I have to believe. I have to believe. Jesus went to the cross and did all that he did there to save me because he loved me. And this God that is talked about for 3,500 years throughout a text that it's incredible that we still have to this day, from cover to cover, screams that God of the universe cares about me individually and personally and wants me to be able to relate to him. And he's given me tools of relationship like prayer and song and solitude and meditation and hearing his word. These are all ways that I get to connect with him and experience his love. Verse 19, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. But whoever does what is true comes to the light. Did a little bit of research because I want to be clear on this. This passage is referring to unbelievers. So if you believe, I, I, I kind of thought of it and wrote it this way. These verses are not here to disturb comfortable hearts. These aren't here to disturb you out of your salvation or make you question your salvation. They are rather here to comfort and bring comfort to disturbed hearts. This should be comforting to those who believe, but it should be uncomfortable to those who don't. There will be a judgment for those who have not believed. And Jesus will be part of that judgment. And so today I'm obviously uh, just as strongly as I possibly can encouraging you to take that step and believe. And if you think, well, it's believe plus, it's not. It's believe only. It's believe only. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. It's just believing in Jesus. If you believe in the light, if you believe in Jesus, this judgment that's spoken of in this passage is not for you. But do you believe? So I don't want to disturb a comfortable heart. I want to comfort a disturbed heart. If you're disturbed about this, here's comfort. Come into the light. Believe in Jesus. And do it now. I don't know why you'd wait, but sometimes we get prideful or we, we get something stands in the way and, uh, and we need a nudge. And maybe today's that nudge. 
if you've been needing a nudge, I, I really pray that this is the, the thing that you've needed. Let's dive in a little deeper to what does it mean. Number one, believing in Jesus makes you right with God. Jesus is the only way to eternal life. He is the narrow gate. He's a narrow gate, but the gate's open wide open. But you've got to come through him. You hear sometimes people um, who are on their deathbed and someone says, you know, hey, you've, before you die, you've got to get right with God. Or someone recognizes already, before I die, I want to make sure I'm right with God. Jesus is the way you get right with God and according to scripture, the only way. You've got to come through him. He made that statement himself, Jesus did. That he is the, the way, the truth, and the life. And the path to destruction and, and the path to hell is broad and fast. The path home to God is narrow because it's Jesus. It's not Jesus and. It's Jesus only. He, he won't have it any other way. And, and if he would, I would tell you and I would encourage you to find that other way. He's the only way. Your good deeds can never catch up with your misdeeds. And a lot of people have this idea that, you know, our, our, our bad and our good is like a scale, right? And so I've done all these bad things and before I came to know Jesus. And so if I can come to know him or if I can work my way toward him and I can begin balancing the scale out and maybe tip it slightly into my favor on the day of judgment that I'll have the scale tipped toward my good deeds and I'll get in. Here's the bad news. No amount of good deeds can tip the scale in favor of your bad. For one reason, and maybe more reasons, but one reason for sure, you won't be able to count all of your bad deeds and keep up with them. Because Jesus said, yeah, I've, I know your bad deeds, but I also know your bad thoughts, and those will be counted against you too. Well, I'm sunk. I've got no hope. If that's true, I'm done. And that's exactly what Jesus wants you to understand. That without him, you're done. That he is the only way. And so you have all of your bad deeds over here. Jesus comes in and just completely flips the scale up. Jesus outweighs all of your misdeeds. He alone. But you can't do it on your own. It will not work. You and I have dug a hole too deep to get ourselves out of. You need someone to rescue you from the outside. Jesus' arms are the only ones long enough to drag you out of the pit that you have created over the years for yourself. Your pit is too deep for you to get yourself out of. And there's no other arm long enough to reach down and get you out. And if you are wondering how long Jesus' arms are, they stretch pretty far. They stretched all the way from one side of the cross and all the way to the other side. The cross is where he stretched his arms out to show you the length that he's willing to go to, to pull you out of the pit of sin that you created for yourself. In another place in scripture, we hear that God separates your sin from you as far as the east is from the west. And there we are again, seeing Jesus in his infinite form, from end to end and beyond, that his outstretched hands will separate you from your sin as far as the east is from the west. I don't know if there's any better news than that for us. That's about as good of news as we can get. Because we cannot get ourselves out of this pit 
It's going to take somebody else. It's going to take someone perfect. It's going to take Jesus, the narrow gate. Number two, God does not hate you. He wants to demonstrate his love for you by saving you through your belief in his son. Belief. From Genesis to Revelation, believe. God does not have to love you. You know this, right? He doesn't have to love us. It's a choice. He has chosen to love you and made this love the very hallmark of his existence. God has demonstrated that he is pleased with this statement for us to say this out loud, God is love. He's good with that. He's okay with that. But he doesn't have to. He chooses to love us as rotten and terrible as we are and as we can be, he chooses to love us. It's called unconditional love. Most of us, if ever, in our life have experienced apart from his love. We get glimpses of it, but all love here has conditions. There's, it, it comes with ties. God's love does not. Unless you consider the only tie is that you have to believe. Believe in him. So I want us to know today that God isn't just simply loving or a loving God. He is love. The Bible tells us that very clearly. God is love. He is love. He is the source and the quintessence of love. I don't even know if that's a word for sure, but it, it works here. The quintessence of love. Without him, we would not know what love is. We couldn't know. And so if you're wondering about who is this God and can I know God, if you want to know if there is a God, the fact that there is love may be all the proof that you need. If you've ever experienced love, if you've ever seen love, if you know what love is, it proves there's a God because apart from him, there is no kindness in the world. There's no goodness in the world. There's no hope in the world. I suppose the, the best scene that we could possibly come up with is war. Battle. No love. Our understanding of love is so ingrained and deep that we talked about Dr. Gerald Schroeder um, had a video on the, on the um, uh, live or the uh, uh, recorded version of this a couple weeks ago. And Dr. Gerald Schroeder said that within the universe, everything outside the universe and a lot of the space inside the universe is nothing. Well, not within, but, at, but without to be specific, be accurate. Beyond the bounds of the known universe is nothing. And he said, our minds cannot begin to understand or think or fathom what nothing looks like, we have to put something there. Our brains cannot conceive a world without love. And that's who God is. Number three, Jesus demonstrates his divinity, his divineness, his oneness with the Father, by telling us that he is the judge. He will judge the darkness. But not those who come into the light. His judgment falls to the unbeliever. To the one who stayed in the darkness. One of the things that got Jesus in trouble on earth was that he forgave sins. Another person cannot forgive someone who has offended me. So if someone has done me wrong, they have to ask for my forgiveness. Someone else cannot come and say, hey, forgive me for that person. That doesn't make sense. Jesus, when he forgave sins, was declaring that you had offended him. Your sin offended him personally. 
because he was God. The fact that he judges and forgives declares his oneness with God, his divine nature. Jesus could only forgive sin because he was God. Jesus is the only one who can judge darkness because he's light. The light, as John tells us, and as Moses told us in Genesis 1. The light has come, and the world has been different since he came. So what should I do? I, uh, I keep this pretty simple today. Believe. Believe in Jesus. Then once you've believed in Jesus, then believe Jesus. So believe in him, and then believe him. What he says is true. As you read the scripture, you'll find it saying that Jesus wants doers and not hearers only. So as you read scripture, commit yourself to doing what it says. I don't know what it looks like to him when we hear things and we just dis, uh, dismiss it or excuse it. But I would think if we heard something and acted on that, believing in Jesus, believing in the Bible, believing in God and his word, that Jesus would look at us when we said, okay, I've heard it, now I'm going to do it. I think he would see that as belief. Live it out. Believe in Jesus. And then believe him. Number two, accept that God loves you. Accept it. I know you don't feel like he probably, you, you probably feel like he doesn't. This isn't based on feelings. It's based on who God is and who he says he is, his character. He says that he is love and that his uh, abundance of love is limitless. And he pours it out on you, the undeserving. So I plead with you, if I can, to accept this idea, the fact that God loves you. The cross is all the proof you should need for that. And if you haven't visited the scripture or visited in your mind the cross for a while, if you're feeling unloved by God, go visit the cross. You'll see a God who is willing to give up his son to die for your sin that you're, so that your sins could be forgiven if you would simply believe in him. And then number three, I just ask you to flee any darkness. Are there still some dark pockets either in your mind or in your life that God's light hasn't been able to shine into yet. Maybe you're keeping the, the curtains drawn on those rooms. And so I'm going to ask you today to live your life fully in the light of God's love. Pull back the curtains. Let the light shine in. You will be glad that you did. We're going to take communion now, and I just want to keep this again very simple for the interest of time and, and for the idea of just keeping it very basic. Jesus was in a room with his guys hours before his crucifixion. And there was some bread there and there was some wine present. And G Jesus took these very common, everyday kinds of elements bread and food and drink. And he said something that they'd never heard before. And I can't imagine how odd it sounded, but he took some bread and he blessed it. And he passed it around and, and he said, this is my body. This is my body broken for you, for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and eat.
Then Jesus uh, took a cup. And he poured some wine into it and he passed it around and he said, this is my blood spilled for the remission of sins, to take away your sins. He didn't ask them to understand it all, but he did ask them to drink it. And without hesitation, each one of his disciples took and drank. So let me ask you a few questions and then I'll close in prayer. What would life look like if we lived out each day this week really believing that God loves me? Really believing that he he likes me? I think Darren has a t-shirt that says God likes me. We need to see where he got those t-shirts. God loves me. God likes me. He's not out to get me. That when I'm going through a hard time, I can believe that God loves me enough to use those hard times to correct my path. An unloving God would would allow us not to wander into those rough patches, but he will lead us into there to show us his love. How much better would my week be if I lived each hour totally in the light? No darkness. I open the curtains back on the windows to those dark places of my life. And then what if I let the light of Jesus just shine through me, into me and through me, to show others the way out of their darkness? What a glorious way to live. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son who reflected back to you, your perfect character, your perfect nature, your perfect reflection of who you were. And Lord, by loving us and forgiving us, he demonstrates to us his likeness with you, his divinity, his oneness with the Father. And Lord, because we have Jesus in us, we can share in that oneness. But Lord, we have to let the light in. We have to let your love in. We have to break down whatever barriers are keeping that from coming in and and live in the truth and not listen to lies about who the devil says we are or were or who our, uh, maybe our parents said that we were, other limitations and things that were placed on us. Lord, you say that we're children of God. But you ask us to believe. You ask us to pull back the curtains in the dark places of our, of our lives and our minds and let the light of Jesus in. And so, Lord, shine brightly right now into every heart and mind. Shine so brightly that we begin understanding in a new and fresh way what it means to be loved by you. And shine so brightly that we cannot contain that light and we have to give some of it away this week. We love you. We thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, amen.
was easy to trust Cause you are closer, closer in my skin And you are in the air I'm breathing Here's where the death is